Hey guys, Coach here. Welcome to this week's and next week's episode. We're launching a big one here. So I'm telling all you trolls that don't have patience, if you can't sit around and learn something for about 30 minutes each episode, eh, maybe this isn't for you. But what we're talking about this week is the ABCs of DIY irrigation system installation. So you guys can do it yourself. You don't have to pay a guy like me to come out and spend mega thousands of dollars above and beyond what parts and materials cost. You can do it yourself. You generally do it over the course, depending on the size, of a good long weekend, maybe two. Now, I'll tell you up front, there's a wee bit of math here. Not anything crazy at all. And I'm gonna teach you a little bit about hydraulics. Are you guys ready to get this thing going? You will have a heck of a lot more irrigation knowledge by the time you listen to this week's episode and next week's as well. I'm glad you're here. Let's launch. Okay, one of the things that you just kind of have to, you have to know up front is not everybody needs a sprinkler system. Not every landscape. Depending on where you're located in this country, any other country and around the world, Maybe you do, and maybe you don't. Where Maestro and I live now, up here in northern Maine, I would say less than 5% of the landscapes in and around our area have anything besides maybe some deck drip irrigation, maybe some vegetable garden irrigation, and that's it. You don't see any um, spray heads and rotor heads and impact <laughs> and impact head systems up here. And what are those? We're gonna go over those in just a second. But here's step one, beyond anything else, and I have preached this on all aspects of landscape planning. And an irrigation system is just one more component, one more element of a complete landscape project, is determine the amount of square footage you have to irrigate, and then Determine spacing and overlap. Overlap is gonna be, I'm gonna say that word, I don't know, probably at least a half a dozen times today. Overlap is critical when it comes to irrigation placement and spacing. For the sake of simplicity and for comprehension, I'm gonna go with a lawn irrigation this week. We're going to go into some other stuff next week. We're going to talk about lawn irrigation. We're also going to use a hypothetical uh, 1,000 square foot turf area. So that's our basic thing. Now, what size is your area that you need to irrigate? And now you kind of have a little bit of where I'm going to take this episode. So a couple of things. Note taking and start going out there and understanding where your water source is where your valves are gonna to need to be placed, and then go out there, go to the box stores or hardware store and get yourself some colored flag bundles. And each colored flag is gonna represent a spray head, whether it's the pop-up spray heads, or if it's a pop-up rotor heads, or the pop-up impact heads. So when you're talking about uh, pop-up spray head spacing, if you look at the top of a nozzle, no matter what brand, it will generally have some numbers on it. For instance, you may have a 15H, meaning a 15 foot diameter, and it's a, a 180, a half circle, okay? And then you'll have 15Q or 15F. Um, these all are suggestions at best. And take it from someone who's put in a uh, few hundred irrigation systems, your environmental impact of your location will determine your spacing, not the number on your nozzle, not the number on the nozzle. So if you, uh, if you decide to go with uh, 15 diameters or 12 diameters, or you wanna go with 18 diameters, all good, but subtract three feet every single spacing. If you have 15 foot heads, think 12. If you have 12 foot heads, think nine, because the overlap is what's gonna give you a consistent coverage, and overlap is one of the biggest mistakes DIYers make. They go right by the nozzle, 
and they go 15, 15, 15. Well, the amount of water that is actually getting thrown at that 15 foot mark is droplets, not a good spray pattern. That and uh, overlapping coverage and spacing, biggest mistakes DIYers make. You want to have a three foot overthrow on every single head, every single one. And if you're in a windy area, you, you, maybe you guys down in the southwest of the US, any other places in the world where you have a prevailing breeze all the time, you might have to shrink it even a little bit more to make sure, or you pay attention to when you end up watering. You know when it's gonna be breezy out and when it's not gonna be breezy out. Okay, so one morning when you decide to execute this, you are going to have a list of parts and pieces that you're gonna need that parts and pieces list is going to derive from you going out with your little flags and marking out where your heads need to be on your, on your lawn area. Maybe it's going to be uh, three colors. Maybe it's going to be four colors. Maybe it's going to be six colors because you have a much larger lawn. You will know as soon as you start putting those flags in the ground you, that you have got enough of them or you don't have enough of them. I always say buy more so you don't have to in the middle of Saturday morning go, damn, I gotta go back to the store again. And you have to go back. You can always return the unused portions when your project is completed. I got a PhD in that stuff. Okay, so now you've marked out your, let's just say your four colors of flags. You've spaced them correctly and you've located your water source and you've kind of gauged the distance between where your water source is, where your valves need to go, and then where you're going to have to open up the ground to get all that pipage from your valve assembly out into your lawn area. And then once you're in your lawn area, then to each individual head. Okay, so your parts and pieces list, you're going to be able to estimate from your flag placement how many spray heads you're going to need. And as a result of how many spray heads, you're going to need the connection parts between your spray head and your plumbing system. Oftentimes, what professionals use is uh, what we call swing arm assemblies. Uh, you don't have to use those. They're just nice and they're kind of forgiving if your trench isn't perfectly placed or isn't perfectly depth. They tend to rotate in all directions and raise the sprinkler up to just that right sweet spot right next to the walkway or right next to the driveway. So you, you've got that half inch right below where cars aren't going to hit it, mowers aren't going to hit it. So swing arm assemblies. Then you have your actual plumbing parts and pieces themselves. Now, a lot of times people use PVC pipe. That's kind of the standard everyone thinks about when they think about residential or even commercial. Uh, irrigation systems, but there's also polyethylene pipe, which is a lot more forgiving in colder climates. Uh, they tend to expand and contract a little bit more and aren't as rigid as PVC pipe. So you've kind of measured out the distances between your water source and you're going to have to run plumbing to your valve assembly, and then you're going to have to put your valve assembly together and then pipage coming out from your valve assembly and out into each individual head. Might be a little bit of plumbing, or might be a whole lot of plumbing, but kind of pace it off. Uh, I always suggest investing in one of those roller tapes. Uh, it really, really uh, narrows the specificity down so you're not buying way too much or you really short yourself. Remember, your main trunk trench going from your valves to your lawn area is gonna to need to be just a little bit bigger. In our hypothetical four valve system, you're, depending on the size of your pipe, you're gonna to need to put at least four pipes coming out of your valve assembly and then four pipes going out and then eventually branching off to individual heads. So a little narrow pipe like that, unless you've made it very deep, probably needs to be wider think uh, one inch pipes. So you need at least a six inch trench, which most trenchers generally give you. They generally give you a, a six inch trench by the time it's, it's done, depending on the, the chain itself. So you've, you've gathered up all your parts and pieces list. You've gone down to the store. You've made your initial purchase. 
And believe me, it's a guesstimate. Uh, professionals, like when I used to do it, initially when I didn't have a parts and pieces reserve in my work trailer, yeah, I was the guy going back and forth because I thought I had uh, 30 elbows to get the job done. I needed 35 or I needed two more T's or I needed one more swing arm assembly. You, you see how it can be. So sometimes overbuy initially and then return what you haven't used. It's a good idea and it saves you so much time as well. So now you've gotten all your parts and pieces at home. You've set them aside. Maybe you can do it this weekend. Maybe it's for next weekend and you're still thinking that out throughout your work week. And then on Saturday, it's launch time, it's execution time. Now, a couple of things in your design and layout that I wanna cover in this episode, and that is the plumbing pipes itself and some of the math and hydraulics that go along with it so that when you put in your system, it works just as well at the first head as it does the last head at the end of each run. You have to do a couple of tests initially. What I used to do is I used to take, when I was going to estimate a job, whether it was an overall landscape or maybe just an irrigation job, I would take a, a pressure gauge and I would put them on the spigots, both in the front yard and the backyard, if that was gonna be my connection point, and I would turn it on and see what the PSI is, the pounds per square inch at that faucet. And I have seen a range of 35 pounds up to 90 pounds per square inch of water pressure. Now 90 was really extreme. The average, especially for a modern day home, I would say right around 50, 50 to 60. And that's really a good sweet spot. For you guys on well systems, depending on what kind of pressure switch you have on there, if you have a 65, 45 type of situation, perfect depending on how far between the source and your project system is going to work will depend on uh, pressure. It'll also depend on the amount of GPM, gallons per minute. And all of this comes into play with your plumbing. Um, if you have a, a three quarter inch hose faucet on the backyard, and this is gonna where our, your hypothetical project is, you're doing the backyard and you have a three quarter inch hose bib on there, when you take it off, you have a three quarter inch copper pipe that has 65 PSI at the hose bib. And then you take off that hose bib, make sure you turn off your house water, and you put on a galvanized T or whatever you have and drop that down to your valve assemblies. Then you know that that three quarter inch pipe at about 65 PSI is going to be around nine to 10 gallons a minute. In a minute, you're gonna be able to fill up two five gallon buckets. That's how much water that one faucet is gonna be able to put out. Not too bad, provided that you don't have a huge yard. If you have a small residential yard, three quarter inch systems will work rather, rather appropriately. Now, if you have a, a developer you've bought in a subdivision and the builder gave you what we call stub outs, stub outs are PVC pipes or polyethylene pipes that are away from your front yard uh, hose bib system or where the city water comes into your house, uh, it, sometimes they'll run them around and they'll stub them up just inside the back fence. If you have a one inch stub, then you've upped your game a little bit to about 13 gallons a minute. And that, believe it or not, that little three gallons a minute makes at least another couple heads on each valve, which can save you in valve costs or you know, make your coverage that much better. So determine what you have as far as your house water supply. If you are doing a large project, a rural project, and you're running off of a pressure tank or maybe a double pressure tank, a diaphragm tank, or one of the large galvanized pressure tanks, depending on where you're located at, you, you may have to run inch and a half, two inch amount of plumbing to your valve assembly and then maybe bush it down after it leaves the valve assembly. The biggest that I used to play with was two inch pipe and two inch valves. And those are getting to be pretty big. Now you're talking inch and a half, throwing about 25, 27 gallons a minute. 
and your two inch is upwards of almost 35, 37 gallons a minute, depending on situation, elevation, all kinds of stuff. That's a lot of heads. That's a heck of a lot of heads to, to put out there. But we're gonna talk about our, our small thousand square footer. Let's keep it simple at this point. So on a law of averages, I can remember going to people's homes and I would be able to throw on the pressure gauge, see the, the, the PSI that was at the faucet, knowing that it was a three quarter inch system, it instantly triggered my experience part of my brain to say, okay, I know that I can have, looking at the lawn, I'm gonna have about four, maybe five valves for this front yard. And since it's a three quarter, I know that my valves are only gonna be able to serve about five heads per valve. So you go out there and you've done your flagging and you come back to the valve assembly and then you have maybe a couple of valves left over to do the planting bed areas or the foundation beds, whatever you're going to do. And you have, as you're thinking this all out, it's becoming cemented in your brain exactly what your course of action is going to be. You figured your plumbing size out. You have now taken that plumbing size and matched it to how many heads you're going to need to put out there whether you're doing planter beds or whether you're doing lawn areas. Next week, we're gonna cover another topic that is far more popular in this day and age as compared to when I first started in the business. And pressure and gallons per minute kind of go away a little bit. So tune in next week for that as well. So your standard spray pop-up heads is a uh, one way of irrigating that thousand square foot lawn. Another way is upgrading to bigger heads. And when I say bigger heads, I'm talking about pop-up gear-driven rotor heads or the big maxi or mini paw canister impact heads. They throw more water and they cover more area. It will all depend on what size of turf area you have to irrigate. A thousand square feet, yeah, that, that, a rotor head system, you may only need six as compared to maybe 16 with your pop-up spray heads. So you can kind of see where maybe efficiency of a bigger uh, rotor head might get the coverage, especially if you have a kind of a rectilinear rectangle lawn or square lawn, something that's really easy to cover. And you can adjust those things to where they're 360s, uh, a quarter turn, half turns, three quarter turns, it's all screwdriver adjusted so you can get just what you want. They also, these larger heads come with certain nozzles. They'll come with a pack of nozzles that'll be everything from one gallon per minute all the way up to seven gallons per minute. Seven gallons per minute is throwing a lot of water out there on that lawn. But since we're running off of a three quarter system or maybe a one inch system, we know that I wanna play this close to the vest. So I'm gonna go with a three gallon a minute nozzle and put that in my rotor head that way on my three quarter system, I know I can get three heads per valve. Or if I have a one inch system, four heads, maybe five if you have a lot of pressure and it's really close to the valve assembly, but usually four, maybe five. And then you can adjust them. And that is kind of the gold standard in this day and age was the, was the rotor heads for those medium to large size lawns. Now, if you guys are doing big project, big lawn irrigation, like not too far away from where we live right now, there was a whole hillside of irrigation project last fall, probably an acre and a half of lawn area. And there were more flags out on this hill than Carter has pills. And I'll tell you what, there must have been 10 colors of flags. So whoever's doing it kind of knew what they were doing and trenches for days out there. And it was all done by the middle of October. It was, it was all sealed up and seeded and ready to go. And it even had germination before it got too cold. But you can see projects like that. That's where you're talking two inch pipes servicing areas like that. And then dealing with elevation gain and loss, pushing water uphill or water running downhill. There's all kinds of uh, formulas that you can kind of figure. And there's some tactics that you can use to keep the pressure consistent throughout the whole valve system. You have 60 PSI at the first head and you have 
very little loss at the end of that one valve system. Maybe you have 45 and it still works perfectly fine. So here's one thing I want to leave you with this week, and we've talked about only lawn irrigation so far, is I want you to keep in mind this term, friction loss. Much like in electrical landscape lighting and regular lighting, um, they have voltage drop. In the hydraulic world, there's things called friction loss, and I'll explain it pretty quick. And that is when you have water run, rushing through a pipe and then making a turn and then making a turn and then splitting off at a T and going to heads, just the mere friction of water going through the pipe and making turns, you lose that pounds per square inch uh, a little bit every foot. It's, it's probably um, just a micro amount, but by the time it's at the end, you've lost several pounds per square inch of pressure, and you've also uh, reduced that gallonage per minute out at those last couple of heads, depending on how far you have to go with it. So how do we, how do we combat friction loss? We combat it by stepping the pipes down as we go out through our system. We start with a one inch pipe. And then as, since we're running maybe 150 feet, by the time we are at 100, we're gonna take that one inch pipe and reduce it to a three quarter using a bushing. Then when we have our last couple of heads, we're gonna take that three quarter and step it down to a half. And by the time the last two heads that are being filled with uh, five gallons a minute with a half inch pipe, you know that your pressure is gonna stay fairly consistent all the way down the pipe. You're gonna lose some, but we're gonna mitigate it as much as possible. So remember friction loss and remember step it down if you have some long runs. If Maestro and I ever irrigate this 12,000 square feet monster that's out behind the camera, we might do that, but chances are we're not gonna need a, a lawn system. We're really not, it's too much rain up here in the summertime. Okay, so let's review. We talked about layout, we talked about design, we've talked about uh, parts as far as plumbing, we've talked about purchasing, we're talking about having things in place and ready to go on that morning that you're gonna start. Now, wrap up with tools. Tools are really kind of simple in irrigation. You're gonna have your shovels, usually a trenching shovel and a round nose shovel. You're gonna have a trencher, and most of the time people don't have power trenchers laying around. Uh, if you're really a, a, a garanimal and you wanna get out there with just a pick and shovel, okay, you could use a, a pickmatic and, and pick one of these things out, but geez, just go down and rent a trencher. They're so much easier or you can rent a little mini excavator with a, a trenching bucket and do it that way. So much faster. Get all your trenches done and then whoosh, back the trencher goes. Maybe you only have a four, four hour minimum rental and it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Try not to do anything where you're, you have the trencher all weekend long and for God's sakes, not into the week. Because when you're talking $75 a day or minimum, uh, it starts running, into, starts running into money that you don't really need to be spending. So we're talking about shovels, we're talking about trencher, we're talking about pipe cutters. Keep in mind, if you're not used to being on your hands and knees, uh, gardening or especially stooped over, bent over, if you have some type of back support, if you got back problems, uh, a back belt or something like that to support your back, something to protect your knees, not only from the dirt, but also if you're on your hands and knees a lot doing this stuff. So maybe some knee pads or at a minimum, a, a garden pad. Um, I'll put one of those in the link below as far as you can find them over on our Amazon page. Uh, really helps out at the end of a day, being down on your hands and knees for eight hours, gluing stuff together and putting things together. It's nice to have your knees protected a little bit. Take it from someone who knows. Now, finally, our nomenclature. The things that you're gonna need parts and pieces wise. We talked about pipe. We talked about the standard pipe, PVC, white pipe, the stuff that you see, the box stores, and everybody thinks about when it comes to residential irrigation. PVC pipe comes in a couple of thicknesses. The standard for residential use is the thick walled pipe, Schedule 40, and the thinner walled pipe, not the thin, thin stuff, but what we call the Class 200 pipe. And that is something that has a, a bursting rate at 200 and the schedule 40, I think is around 400 PSI before the pipes actually burst. 
For you guys up in the northern climbs, the polyethylene pipe, both three quarter or one inch, uh, that comes in big rolls and you can find that stuff at box stores and at specialty shops and some hardware stores, I'm sure carry it as well. Now the parts and pieces, as far as L's and T's, bushings and adapters, reducers and all that kind of stuff, those are something that I really suggest before you get going and purchasing, go down and walk the aisle, pick up pieces, tactilely learning what the L is and the T, the threaded reducing L's and the reducing T's when you're getting out to your spray head connections. These are things that's nice to know before you're actually throwing the, the credit card down and you've got trenches at home waiting. You've known, you've gone out and done some due diligence and you've learned it. Lastly, for PVC stuff, you have glues and primers, you have pipe cutters, and for polyethylene pipes, most of the time they're compression fittings. They're the screw-on compression fittings, and they're, they're kind of neat to work with. I, I did a project in Idaho a few years ago, and you don't have, at least out there in the field with polyethylene pipe, you don't have glue and primer to have to worry about knocking over. And man, have I knocked over a few gallons of that stuff in my time. And lastly, depending on what kind of valves you have, whether they're anti-siphon valves that look like this, or if they're inline valves, ones that are subsurface that kind of look like this, it's nice to put them in a protective box and you can find those boxes anywhere you buy irrigation parts and pieces. So this is chapter one. Next week, we're gonna wrap this up with different kinds of application and various techniques to put other stuff in. I hope you got something from this. With the amount of knowledge that you got here today, I hope I've earned a subscribe, I really do. And at least at the very least a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys next week. As always, to your landscape success and your irrigation success, if you need some help or you need a coach, hey, I'm only an email away. And I can always, I can always consult with people by the hour if you want to. Check it out over on the website, youryardcoach.com. Anyway, guys, till next Friday. I'm Coach. Take care. Bye for now.